This is a production of Cornell University. <laughs> so um, today I'm going to talk about some of the different types of projects that I've been involved in in Geneva. And this is going to seem possibly like a schizophrenic talk. And if so, that's because my job is a little bit schizophrenic. I work in two research units, both the Plant Genetic Resources Unit. And those of you who are lucky enough to hear Joanne last week speak, she's in this unit. But I also work with the Grape Genetics Research Unit. So this one is involved in um, conservation of crops and it's a seed bank sort of, sort of group. And this one is more involved in understanding grape genomics and genetics and disease resistance. So let's just start by talking about what is a computational biologist. There's a lot of terms you hear, bioinformatics, computational biology. And I like the term computational biologist because it explains the fact that I am first a biologist but I do it by computers. So my original training was in genetics. I think about the structure, function, and evolution of genomes, but I do it in a computer instead of at a lab bench or in the field. So that's the perspective that I come to this with. I started as a biologist and then added the computers. So here is why what I do is going to sound a little bit complicated, and that's because it is. 80% of my time is paid for by the folks who work in the clonal repository, and clonal just means that these crops are grafted. So that's the apples, the tart cherries, and the grapes that we curate in Geneva, and we distribute the germplasm and characterize it, and I'm part of the characterizing process. 24% of my time were, is working with the seed repository. And there are many, many vegetables in this repository. Joanne is in this group. And one of them is tomato. And you'll see some uh, work that we did in tomato there together. 15% of my time is on apple rootstock breeding with Gennaro Fazio, who's in this, this section. And then the remaining 20% of my time is split between working on grape scion genomics and grape disease resistance. So I work on a vast variety of types of questions and a vast variety of organisms. And so what you're going to see today is going to cover a lot of organisms and a lot of questions. So just bear with me. Strap your seatbelt in, because it's going to be fast. But what I'm going to try and do is at least get across what it is we wanted to find out, why we wanted to find it out, and what we found out. But there's a lot of projects, so just bear with me. So the first, the first series of projects I'm going to talk about actually came out of a collaboration with people in this very department. Um, Courtney and Surin approached me many years ago and asked me, what could we do with the resistance gene analogs in Rubus. And I realized there's an opportunity here to work out a system that could be applied to the other crops that we have in our repository. And so we did that. And actually, what came out of that was also, eventually later, a master's thesis from a student at RIT. So one of the things I've done in Geneva is help supervise or act as a functional thesis advisor for master's students working in the field of bioinformatics at Rochester Institute of Technology who need real life pro problems to work on and somebody to help guide them through that they can apply what they've learned toward and then make it into a thesis. And there's two theses I'll talk about today. And one of them um, was done with Aubrey Bailey. So it's kind of neat to see the progression. And one of this project actually came out of something that was a collaboration originally from this department. So in this project, we collected a whole bunch of um, resistance gene analogs. Now what's convenient about these NBS LRR resistance genes is that they have conserved frag sections that can be used for sitting primers down. And then you can amplify between them to get the variable part. 
And you can all, because that's a convenient thing to do, lots of people have done this in other organisms besides the ones that we gathered the sequences from. So we gathered a whole bunch from Gene Bank. We collected some from Cherry from our collection. We collected a whole bunch from apples in our collection. And there were even the ones that we got from the project with Courtney. And with these, what Aubrey, the student from RIT, was able to do was to cluster these. And we were able to see, classify these resistance genes according to what their sequence similarity was based on a um, hypothetically translated protein sequence. So this was a huge, huge, huge project. And we were also involving all of the resistance genes found in the recent, then recently sequenced apple genome. So we did a big tree. We found that they were classified, that there were some resistance genes that were not even found in domestic apple at all, but they were available in other wild species. And that's important because if you're trying to find parents to breed for novel resistance in apple, you might want to go for the samples in our germplasm collection that have novel resistance gene analogs. So that, that can in turn help breeders. And meanwhile, we've also, with a big group that involved uh, collaborators from all over the world, we've mapped some of these resistance gene analogs to um, fire blight resistance loci. And recently, we're just finishing it up. There's one that might actually, uh, it came from a powdery mildew resistant cherry strain. Um, and Amy Iazzoni in Michigan State is mapping QTL there. And so it may be that we will also have a similar um, result that these things are showing up in the same part of the genome that is involved in known resistance for cherries as well. So that was, that was one project. We're switching gears now. Now here's another type of project I've done. And this one had to do with figuring out what the risk was of transferring, transmitting resistant alleles, or sorry, um, disease susceptible alleles, depending on which grape root stock you use. So there was a question with this freedom grape root stock. It's valuable because it's nematode resistant. But the question about freedom is, does it already have, is it likely to already have phylloxera resistance or not? If it's likely to be phylloxera susceptible, then it might not be so good for breeding more grape root stocks. So the question in this case was more of a paternity analysis question because if we could piece together who the parents and grandparents were of freedom, and if they were not vinifera, then freedom was more likely to be resistant to phylloxera. We knew that freedom was derived from open pollinated parents, and there were 31 potential pollen donors in a grape, in a vineyard in Fresno that David Ramming won USDA um, grape breeder had, but we didn't know which parents might be the actual pollen donors. So we did, took 30 microsatellite markers, and this is old technology, but it's still interesting. So we took 30 microsatellite markers, and we looked at this genetic tree of freedom and also of its half-sib harmony, and we started asking, who are the pollen donors? And we found some of them. So. We knew that, um, and also some of these individuals were dead. So the ones in the boxes are definitely dead. And um, we knew that the mother of freedom was 161359. We were able to confirm that because that sample was still alive in the vineyard when we tested. We knew that the mother um, <coughs> for 16, the grandmother was supposed to be 1613C. We confirmed that. And then we identified that the grandfather of freedom was a cross, derived from a cross between riparia and rupestris, neither of which is vinifera. 
which is really nice because that means that it's less likely to be susceptible to phylloxera. We also tried to find these individuals, but it appears that they were no longer alive in the vineyard or else their alleles weren't unique enough to be able to identify with this study. So that was a paternity analysis in grape that we did. Okay, switching gears again. Here's another master's thesis. This one's on a completely different organism. It's not even a plant. We're talking about fungi now. Lance Cadle Davidson is a collaborator of mine in Geneva, and he works on disease resistance in grapes and in, on their pathogens. And he had a project where he had a lot of sequence from a great many different varieties of grape powdery mildew. And the problem, and, and he got his thesis this year, or just this past year, and um, he was, again, another RIT student that I had supervised for his thesis. And the problem with grape powdery mildew, which is here, is that there was almost no information about it. There were maybe five sequences in GenBank altogether or something on it. It was very, very few. And its next closest relative that we knew anything about was way down here, Blumeria graminus. Now this one was sequenced, and there was a paper where um, lots of people got together and annotated it, but there was nothing available for this organism. And so what we did was we went to transcriptomics, so we took the transcripts, and we had to figure out how to assemble a reference transcriptome from scratch, and then how to describe the polymorphisms among the different isolates, and we had 56 of them if you include the reference version. So this was an example of taking an organism that you know almost nothing about from scratch and figuring out what you can just from the transcriptome. So together, um, Jason and I worked out a workflow, and this was a lot of trial and error. We had a lot of 454 sequencing of, the, um, of one single isolate, and then we had a lot of Illumina paired in sequencing data from that isolate plus 55 other geographic isolates. Now what's different about these isolates is that some, there's a, there's a genetics arms race going on between the powdery mildew and the grape. And the question is, what regions of the powdery mildew genome are mutating more quickly? Because if we can figure out which ones are mutating more quickly, we might have a clue as to which parts are helping the powdery mildew gain access, foothold into the vineyards where there's supposed to be resistance. So in other words, how it's winning its side of the arms race. So that was the whole object. So in order to do that, first we had to figure out how to assemble the genome, or sorry, the transcriptome. So it was assembled, it was mapped to the closest relative, and then we also did paired-in sequencing, assembled that, and assembled that de novo. Out of these three different assemblies, we devised ways of ascertaining which assembly was the best one. And that's tricky all in itself, because is it by length of contigs? Is it by number of contigs? And, or is it maybe by how many protein sequences are predicted that make sense based on what you expect in, say, the next closest relative? So you have to balance a lot of different um, criteria in order to figure out which is your best assembly to begin with. Now, once we did do that, then we did some finer tuning of figuring out which genes we had relative to what was known in Blumeria graminis, the nearest relative. And then we took the single end sequence, or the, the other isolates, and aligned them as well. Put this all together and ended up putting it in a genome browser so our scientific colleagues at the bench in other parts of the country and the world could then go and identify these 
regions and start to focus their research on them. So here's an example of, of some of the types of ways that we would visualize the data in order to figure out if what we had even made sense. Over here on the left is simply a scatter plot of contig length versus number of reads in the contig. So the idea is that you would want to have bigger contigs ought to be bigger, not because you have the same read piling up on top of itself over and over and over, but rather you have multiple reads all sticking next to each other, building a larger and larger and larger contig. And it's sort of comforting to see that we do have a relationship there where you have more contigs or more reads in the larger contigs. So that means the assembly is probably working fairly well and that the libraries weren't just copies all of the same transcript over and over and over and over um, on top of each other. Because even when you normalize, that doesn't always necessarily work. So this was good confirmation that the assembly seemed to be working and that the normalization had worked pretty well. And then you want to ask, well, if the contigs, as they get longer and longer, then they ought to match things that you expect to see in that organism better and better and better. Because if you do, say, a blast match between two different sequences, the score that you get is dependent on the length of that match. So the longer, the longer that section of sequence is that matches, the better your score is. And so if you have a contig that's longer, it ought to have better potential to match a long contig somewhere else. In other words, it ought to have a better blast score. And so here is a graph with the con length of the contigs along the x-axis. So the longer contigs are over here and the shorter contigs are here. And here is the um, blast score. And you can see that while we do get some longer contigs with pretty low blast matches, the best blast matches do come from the longest contigs. And that makes sense. So that means that these are probably matching what what they should. So not only did the assembly assemble things end to end to end the way they should have, but the things it assembled actually are matching stuff that we expect to see. And this is all the sort of work that you have to go through when you've got a brand new organism nobody knows anything about. Jason did a lot of work for this. He did a good job. So let's just take a look at how much did we see versus what we expected to see. Now, um, one of the ways that we did our annotation, the way we labeled what we found in the um, powdery mildew genome, was we did reciprocal blasts. So we searched the powdery mildew genome with the Blumeria graminous transcripts, or protein sequences. And then we searched the Blumeria graminous sequences with the powdery mildew sequences. And whenever there was a reciprocal one-to-one -one match, so protein A liked protein, Blumeria protein A liked uh, powdery mildew protein B better than any other powdery mildew protein. And powdery mildew protein B liked Blumeria protein A better than any other Blumeria protein. That's what we call a reciprocal one-to-one -one best match. And that's just one quick and dirty way to figure out whether those two things are most likely to be the um, analogs of each other in each genome. And so of when we did this, we found 4,000 or 4,500 reciprocal best matches. In the Blumeria genome altogether, we had only 6,000 queries. So that means if, if powdery mildew has about the same genome size and about the same number of proteins in its transcriptome as Blumeria, then we found over two-thirds of them. And that's pretty good. 
And they're not the closest relatives in the world. I mean, when you saw that tree, there's a lot of things in between. And fungi mutate quick. So it's not bad. It's, I mean, for, for the next closest relative. Um, and that was how we labeled the genes, or the proteins that we found in powdery mildew. Now, we also characterized these, um, these proteins among the, all the different 56 isolates. So we took our, what we had oversequenced, our reference isolate, and then compared all the other 55 isolates to it. And some of these, like this one and this one and this one, had and disproportionate, these are artifacts. These are not, um, these, these numbers of SNPs and indels are not because of biological fact, but because these are actually pooled samples themselves. So these samples here actually represent multiple isolates. And that was um, an artifact of how this, the laboratory work was done at the beginning before we figured out how to properly barcode the samples. <laughs> but the other ones did have numerous SNPs and indels. And the breakdown was sort of interesting about of all the um, predicted um, protein differences, about 21% were non-synonymous. Of those 21%, um, or 18% of the total were non-synonymous, and 3% actually looked like stop codons. Now these are all obviously based on low quality alumina type high throughput sequence, so there's always the possibility of sequencing error. And there's also um, the fact that we're conceptually translating these to begin with, as well as comparing them to their nearest relative protein sequence in, in another organism that who knows how close it really, really is, but it's our best chance, so that's all we've got. Um, but altogether, um, what we can say is that the regions where we found, so 18 or 20 percent of those polymorphisms do look like they might be involved in this arms race between the pathogen and the host. And so those are now the ones that, here's the genome browser, and here are the genes, and you can see the various positions where there are mutations. Um, and these are now the regions of the genome that our bench colleagues can focus on to find possible um, genes related in, over, in, in what powdery mildew uses to overcome the resistance of the host to its infection. So that was, that was a fun project. Okay, now we're going to move back into plants. And um, I was one of the people early on a few years ago who um, started looking at how to do, along with Paula here, but in a different um, set of grape species um, or grape populations, how to use genotyping by sequencing data to get information about um, uh, genes responsible for traits. And so one of the projects I did was I compared the tassel pipeline, which is pure genome-wide association mapping, and traditional QTL mapping, just to see what would work. And the population I used in this case um, segregate, it was two populations actually, uh, Y1 by Y3, so the blue versus the red, and then Y1 versus Y4, so the blue versus the green. And so for various traits that had to do with table <coughs> grape quality, so in other words, less seeds or no seeds, um, berry size, that sort of thing, which is all what you care about is you, you want a big berry with no seeds in it, or at least that's what the public wants. So that's what David Ramming wants because he's breeding table grapes. And so our populations had um, 71 offspring between these two individuals and 17 offspring between these two individuals. We genotyped these two individuals three times each and this individual twice. And that becomes important later when, when you try to do QTL mapping 
you need in order to create a genetic map you really do if you're doing GBS you really do need to get deeper coverage of the parents so let's just talk real briefly about genotyping by sequencing probably most of you here have seen this a million times some of you have even displayed this slide before yourselves <laughs> I've seen you do it at PAG um, but I borrowed this slide from the workshops that the Institute of Genomic Diversity um, provides and um, that's because it's a good slide basically genotyping by sequencing is a way of getting polymorphism out of a genome with just using restriction enzyme fragments and high throughput technology I'm not going to go into a whole lot more detail about it right now but basically what you need to know is we do genome complexity reduction by choosing the restriction enzyme so in other words the way we pick where the genotyping is going to occur is by what the restriction enzyme site is going to be that cuts and then we use that information to figure out where the polymorphisms are and figure out the um, yeah figure out the polymorphism so you're doing marker discovery and genotyping simultaneously the advantage of this over chips if you haven't heard this already is if you have a SNP chip you have to already know what the diversity you expect or what the polymorphisms you expect to see are going to be otherwise you won't see them because you're not assaying for them this way if it's there in a restriction site and you cover the genome deeply enough you will see it and so you can either have a loss of a site which is a lot harder to see because this data, these data are very patchy or what you can have is a difference in sequence between two sites and that's much much easier to ascertain just as a side note I tried to do a project for somebody once where sample two was gamma irradiated so there were big there are supposed to be deletions in the other genome and it completely failed with GBS so it if you're thinking of trying to find deletions by GBS talk to me first <laughs> because there's a lot of issues and and we I gave it a really hard good solid try and I wasn't able to do that so I would not actually consider it very good at finding deletions but it is good at finding polymorphisms when the site is found between multiple organisms so it's pretty cheap it scales well it there's no ascertainment bias and then lab wise it's nice because you don't have to size fractionate the way you would have to do with rad tags which is another way of doing this sort of data gathering and you can pick your restriction enzyme based on how frequently it cuts and whether or not it's methylation sensitive and so on so if you're trying to avoid certain parts of the genome that might be methylated say you want to go for the euchromatin I'm probably dating myself using that term right if you want to go for the parts of the genome that have the genes in them versus the non-coding part of the genome you might want to go for methylation sensitive enzymes or something like that so um, that's what's nice about that and so you can pick how often you get a marker and so on so let's go back to these two great populations um, called and mapped genotypes there are 19 chromosomes in grape with the QTL analysis um, there were many fewer markers called for each chromosome and we could we obviously were able to map them because we were using join map to map these things with tassel which was a GWAS method we used all of the taxa not so for for these were this for uh, this version we used um, just the biggest mapping population the 71 offspring for the GWAS we were able to throw all the data in and um, genetic mapping wasn't done we just tried to assume where the markers fell based on the grape genome sequence that's been published now that's also problematic because we know that some of these markers that when we did our mapping with um, join map that those markers did not show up where the grape genome assembly said they were so when you use this type of method you have to watch out for that sort of thing but the bottom line was that no matter which method you used it often found the same region of the genome so 
the seedlessness, known seedlessness, Q, seedlessness, QTL on linkage group 18 was found both with tassel, which are the green dots, and with map QTL, which are the blue dots. So if you have enough data and the, data and the system is robust enough, you will find your, um, your associations either way. So just to summarize the difference between these two methods, um, if you're doing traditional mapping, you'll get about 10 times less markers because you need to be confident in how they are phased between the two parents. Um, it requires a high depth, high read depth for the parents. So remember I said I, we genotyped Y1 and Y3 each three times. And if we had not done that, we would have had problems doing traditional mapping. And there was another project that was trying to do the same thing with a different population in grape. And Paolo remembers. <laughs> and that was tricky because those parents had only been genotyped once. So I tried running that data set through my pipeline, and I was not able to get a genetic map because I didn't have enough information for what the markers should be according to what the parents were because we didn't, the parents weren't sequenced deeply enough. Um, and with the traditional mapping approach, you can create the map. You don't have to, um, you don't have to have an existing map or assembly. With GWAS, you get a lot more markers, and it's a, it's a brute force method more. It uses just the sheer number of markers to work, and it allows imputation. This one, this method, we did not do imputing. Um, in this method, you can genotype parents once, and that might be good if you had, say, a big open pollinated population out in nature, and you're just trying to find out um, how the traits were associated in that. Um, or if you had a population that you inherited from another breeder and you weren't really sure how the individuals were related because you couldn't find their notebooks or something like that, um, but it was a valuable enough population to spend time on because it had the trait you wanted. So um, GWAS would probably be better for that. Um, now it turns out that the VitisGen project is actually working on a way to do mapping, genetic mapping, from these data without having to go through some of this process. And I'm, and I'm really excited to see how their unique pipeline will work in some of the projects I'm going to be, that I'm working on at the present. So stay tuned, and I'll let you know how that works out. OK, we're going to switch gears again. Um, but this time only to a different grape population. And I just want to show you, um, this is one of those slides that I had to make purposely vague, because I know this is going to end up on YouTube. Um, we have mapped a grape trait, a developmental trait, to one of the chromosomes um, with really strong QTL evidence using this same technology where we take the GBS data, we filter it down, and then we do traditional um, genetic mapping and QTL mapping with it. And this population is beautiful. It's got 142 offspring, which is huge for a clonal crop. It's great. Um, we ended up with a little over 2,000 markers on a paternal map because the trait is segregating between uh, in, the, in the father. And we got a decent number of markers in each of the linkage groups, about 100 or so. And so here's, here's a trait. And uh, hopefully, by this time next year, I'll be able to tell you what it is openly because we'll have published it. <laughs> OK. Um, Finally, um, one other thing I thought would be fun to tell you about is sometimes when I'm doing the type of work I'm doing, there aren't tools to do what I want to do. And so part of my job sometimes, not so often most of the time, because most of the time there are other research labs out in the world doing what the same kind of thing, and I can take their tool and use it for our purposes. But sometimes there isn't a tool like that or I don't know about one, or I think of one, and then I make it. So I just thought I'd mention this one to you guys just for fun. So in this tool, um, it, was a, it, was a, it was, came out of an idea I got from attending Carl Siebert's course. So anybody here who hasn't attended or thought about attending Carl Siebert's chemometrics course, 
ought to think about it, especially if you ever spend time in Geneva, because it's not just about wine and beer characteristics. It's about how to do multidimensional analysis. And I am not trained in statistics. I'm a geneticist, you know? I was trained in like molecular genetics and a little bit, I had to teach classical genetics when I was a, when I was a grad student. But statistics is not something I'm, I'm that strong in. And so I really enjoyed taking Carl Siebert's course in Geneva. And one of the methods that he taught us about was how to do principal components analysis. And I started thinking about this and I thought, you know, genetically, if you have two homozygotes and a heterozygote between them, from a genetic perspective, the heterozygote is actually genetically intermediate, right? If the traits are codominant. So why not do piece, code those, those genotypes as ones and zeros and twos and treat it like PCA and see if you get correlations between the genotype and a trait or a, or a behavior or, or some kind of characteristic that you're interested in. So we tried it and it works. And what's really cool about it is that it's a way to assess genetic correlation um, between the markers and the characteristics because you can get a principal components loading plot. So you, you can actually say, okay, which principal coordinate actually separates my sample according to, say, fruit size or something. And if, and, if, and if one of them does and the bigger fruits are over here and the littler fruits are over here according to that one principal coordinate, then you can actually take this, the data and go back and ask which markers contributed to that principal comport, which, which ones are actually giving, which genotypes, which alleles are giving you that axis. And that tells you what part of the genome might be involved. So it's, it's a kind of a cool thing to do. The other thing that's nice about it, and the examples I'll show you here are from this application, and that is it's a direct way to visualize genetic relationships among organisms. Because you can just plot them according to their principal components genetically, and this different, the spacing you see is the genetic spacing. It's the actual like um, amalgam of, or an addition of all the different um, genetic markers. And it's, so it's not multidimensional scaling where it's just taking all the data and trying to like figure out a way to stretch it out. No, these are the actual physical points in space, triangula you know, triangulated points in space that you get when you look at genetic, um, the, the sum of the genetic differences among these organisms according to these different components that separate them. So um, this has been published, and um, the example in the paper is tomato data. So I promised tomato data. Here it is. Um, in our collection in Geneva that Larry Robertson curates, we have um, samples of tomato DNA, well, samples of tomato, which obviously contain the DNA. See, that's where I'm a geneticist, because I'm like, we have samples of tomato DNA in the actual tomato plants, yeah. <laughs> And the question is, um, can we genetically tell which samples are closer to the origin of domestication? So let me see if I still have this slide here. No, I don't. OK, so let me explain what happened here with tomatoes. Those of you who saw Joanne's talk last week saw a really nice cartoon of this. But basically, tomatoes were domesticated in three general area parts or three place that overlaps with Chile, Ecuador, and Peru. So this little spot in South America, that's where all the wild tomato diversity is. That's where people came and said, oh, we could eat these tiny little things. And then they started like eating them. And somehow in the deep dark history of tomato, um, they started becoming domesticated. And eventually the better ones started spreading. And so we have samples from Chile, Ecuador, and Peru. We also have samples from the countries contiguous to them. And then what happened was the conquistadors came from Europe to South America and said, oh, what are these things you people are eating? Let us take them back. So they took them to Europe. And that was a bottleneck in 
in the geno in the diversity of tomatoes. So only a subset of the tomatoes got to go and visit Europe. And then when people from Europe started colonizing North America, they brought some tomatoes from Europe up to North America. So there have been two major bottlenecks in the history of tomato that led to the germplasm that we have here. Now subsequently there's been other things like um, introgressions from other wild species back in that started in the 1940s. But before 1940, if you saw a tomato, it was usually um, most diverse if it was from where tomatoes were domesticated, a little less allelic diversity in the sample in Europe, and then even less in North America. And that was the conventional wisdom. And the question was, could we see this in the tomatoes in our collections? So we looked at um, 50 different accessions. 14 were from Chile, Ecuador, and Peru. Six were from countries next to Chile, Ecuador, and Peru and 30 were from places other than that, like other continents. And sure enough, um, first of all, it's kind of interesting, the first principal component explained 20% of the variation in the data, in the genetic data. The second principal component explained 10% more, and the third explained 6% more. So only probably, I mean, you don't really need to look deeper than three, unless you wanted to say, compare fruit size or something like that. And maybe one of the components later than that might explain the specific kind of variation you're interested in. But if you're looking at just the diversity among the samples and not looking for certain traits, traits, diversity in a certain trait, then this is probably good enough just to stop at the first three. And sure enough, the biggest cloud are these yellow dots. These represent the 14 samples from the primary center of diversity. And the red dots are a little bit less inside of that cloud. They're a subset of that cloud. Those are the ones that made it to places like Argentina, where they're contiguous to Chile, say, but not in the, in the center of diversity or where they were um, domesticated originally. And finally, when you look at the last few, which is the last 30. It's hard to see in this picture, but actually that is, it, you can actually rotate these plots if you use R, which is a really nice stats package that's free. Um, you can see that the blue dots are actually inside of the yellow dots and actually smaller than this big red disk. And so actually it worked. And you can actually see that the um, tomatoes that come from the places furthest from where they were originally domesticated have the le least allelic diversity. This method also works in grapes. We did a big study where we looked at 120 accessions of grapes both in our collection and some from China that were brought by our collaborator. And we asked, how do these things look if you sequence 30 different genes and you throw their, their sequences into this PCA thing, what does it look like? Well, here are the first three principal components. And the North American grapes are in this pale blue color. The European grapes are in this sort of orange color. And the Asian grapes are in the blue color. And there are a few that are known hybrids that are other colors. And again, what's really interesting to see is that some of the North American grapes that come from the part of North America near Asia are a little more like the Asian grapes. Kind of interesting. And we were also able to show with this, we were able to see in some cases where things that were labeled as North American were probably hybrids with vinifera, like this one here. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, a fun, it's, it's fun sometimes to develop your own tools to answer questions about what you're seeing in the data. And this project is being written up by Heidi Schwaniger and a team of us in Geneva. Actually, it's been written up, and, it's, and we're in the cycles of submitting and resubmitting at the moment. So that's a fun, a fun thing, too. <laughs>
So um, looks like I'm going to leave enough time for students to ask questions, which will be nice. Um, we have some other projects in the works, just big ones. Um, I've just started surveying apple germplasm for sRNA alleles. And this is coming out of a project that um, was spearheaded by Ganyuan Zhang and Sean Miles um, that you may remember from working with Ed Buckler on grape uh, SNP diversity. And what they're doing is, or what, what we have all as a group done, and this also involves collaborators in Fort Collins too, um, we've taken 42 species and 1,600 accessions from our collection as well as some other um, domestica, proprietary domestica varieties that we don't have our in collection and done a huge GBS survey of them. And um, two enzymes were used. Remember I mentioned that in GBS you can use uh, different enzymes. You can also combine enzymes to get different coverage of the genome. And of that data, what Sean and his team are doing are looking at the diversity among the apple germplasm. But because these data involve small snippets of sequence, it's also possible to hunt in them for genes of interest, known genes of interest. And so one thing that I'm doing with Gennaro Fazio is hunting for um, markers in the region of the sRNA alleles. And I guess I should explain what the sRNA alleles are and why this is important. Apple is self-incompatible. So if you want to make an apple that breeds true, the only way to do that is to graft it. That's why it is a clonal crop. Okay. Now, many, many of you may already know this, but in case you didn't, now you do. If you want to breed one apple to another, it has to have a different sRNA allele. And that's why, for example, when you grow an apple orchard, you need to have other than something, say you have a big bunch of big big bunch of golden delicious trees and you want golden delicious apples. Well, if you don't include at least one crab apple or some other non-golden delicious pollinator, you will not get apples at all. Okay? Is that clear? Great. All right. So also, suppose you want to make apple germplasm or breed apples. You don't just want to grow them. You want to breed them. Well, you need to know what the resistance alleles are, right? So what we're hoping is that once we survey our collection for all these different possible alleles, that we may be able to suggest good alternative breeding parents for creating new varieties. And I see some of the people who work on apple breeding nodding, so I'm on track and I'm glad they agree. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, that's, that's one project that we're doing. We'll also hunt, because I still have those friends, remember way back when I talked about the RGAs and the fire blight resistance? Well, those, those colleagues down there in uh, West Virginia are also interested in disease resistance genes still. So once we've figured out how to survey these GBS markers for sRNA alleles will branch off into other things. And one might be fire blight resistance. And there may be, say, dwarfing traits or other um, interesting traits that we want in apples. And we'll hunt for them because it's a nice big database. And then we'll be able to suggest parents. Another project that's um, started is um, Lance Cale Davidson has a um, person that he's hired for um, hired into his lab who wants a master's degree in bioinformatics. So she's actually now, now in this case instead of RIT giving us a student, we're actually giving RIT a student, but it's still going to work in a similar way. She's enrolling in RIT in bioinformatics, and Lance and I will um, work together with our colleagues at RIT to mentor her through that process. And she's working on the pathogen Botrytis cinerea. So there's some, there's some fun other research projects going on. And just briefly, because I know um, that in the guidelines for, um, for what we are supposed to talk about for these adjunct appointments, um, I just thought I'd mention that I also do a lot of outreach. So 
I travel to career fairs and I've given um, guest lectures in high schools and like in Trumansburg High School. Um, I have a friend who teaches biology, AP biology, and so I've given crop domestication lectures there. Um, we help with um, making DNA with kids. And so there's a, a lot of fun outreach things that we get to do with this type, type of job too. We go to Empire Farm Days, talk to the public about the kinds of work that we do in Geneva and so on. Um, so there are way, way, way too many collab individual collaborators to mention. So instead what I'll do is I'll just quickly mention the labs that I've collaborated with. In Geneva, in the USDA, that's every other scientist in the unit, basically. And some, sadly, are no longer in the group, but I've enjoyed working with them. There are USDA scientists elsewhere that I have worked with and still work with. There are Cornell scientists I've published with. Um, and I'm happy. If any of you have any kind of idea for a project that would relate to our germplasm or our grape cyan or disease resistance work, let me know. Or if you have a student that you want help guiding because they have some bioinformatic component, let me know. I'd be happy to talk to you. Um, there's also scientists elsewhere. There's Amy Izoni, Michael Malinoy, David Francis, Sue Gardner. Um, Andrews Pyle, Mark Sultan, Yingxin Wan, and finally there were um, two RIT students that did master's theses. They came in as summer students, liked working with us so much that they decided to stay and make their project based on, their, their thesis project based on what we worked on. So that's it, and thank you so much for your attention, and I'd love to answer questions. Um, okay, so the question was whether this, this data set looked like it matched the gene flow. And the, the answer is that except for these, none of these are developed lines. These are Vitis vinifera and, and their wild relatives. And the rest of these are all basically wild accessions. And so nobody really knows how grapes evolved. The problem is that there looks like there was one big giant explosion of grapes all at once. And so that's part of the problem with visualizing these data with a phylogenetic tree, is because what you get is a big brush of, of everything all splitting off almost at once. The other thing that's tricky is that almost all of these freely interbreed with each other. So as soon as you move one somewhere else, they just start happily interbreeding. There's only one grape in North America and s that doesn't do that because it has a slightly different number of chromosomes. <laughs> and, um, and even it can be made to crossbreed. And some people think it doesn't even belong in vitus necessarily, or they think it's like a, an outgroup. So, um, so it does match what we might expect. But it's really hard to know what to expect given that none of the trees and none of the history of grape as a species or a genus is clear. Thanks, Dave. Yeah? Now, Angela, these are all wild accessions, but uh, I know that uh, somebody's mapped out the, the germ plasma collection up in Geneva, which are you know, hybrids and things. Uh -huh. Have those been mapped onto a similar? I don't know if they've, I'm not sure they've taken that data. I think that that project came from a SNP data project. Yeah. And remember I said that GBS was better than SNP chips because there's no ascertainment bias? The problem, the reason SNP chips are bad for some organisms is because if you have a highly outcrossing clonal crop, so this thing is not an annual, and it's, and it's highly outcrossing, you have so much heterozygosity expected and so much diversity that if you use chip technology to assay a collection, you're going to miss all of the diversity that wasn't in the original samples that were used to design the chip. And so even if it, I, I, I can't really say because it was not exactly the same co collections, first of all, and are the same samples, but even if it were, it's, we were directly sequencing with PCR. So if we found diverse, if there was diversity, we found it. And they, were, they used a different technology 
And so I'm not sure that what they found would have been representative. But then on the other hand, they were surveying more of the genome, whereas we were only surveying 30 locations. So it's hard to, it's hard to compare those. Okay. But, but as far as the conventional understanding of how grapes evolved in general, I would say this is pretty accurate. Maybe we didn't expect two separate lumps of North Americans. I think that might have been unexpected. And definitely, um, as far as identifying hybrids and mislabeled accessions, this works too. This corroborates that sort of thing, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, for the powdery mildew? Sure. Oops. Yes. We did try to do that, but the computers we had access to were not powerful enough, and this guy needed to get out. He was only working on a master's, so we only had him for a year. <laughs> we couldn't keep, keep, nope, nope, sorry, you have to stay here for three more years. <laughs> so if, if, if we had had access to more powerful computers and more time, I think a hybrid assembly would have worked, but unfortunately, it didn't because of technology. Thanks for the question. Yes? Do we know how long ago that explosive radiation occurred in grapes? Um, we have an estimate, and I cannot remember what the number is, but I can look it up for you if you're interested. I believe it's prehuman. It's probably prehuman, but you know what? I will look it up and I will get back to you on that. Yes? And the North American and Asian population is looked very distinct, so. Yes. The North American and Asian, whoops, sorry, wrong way. Okay, um, they aren't as distinct as they look because if you rotate this thing, you'll see that these fall in the same plane. And um, if you're interested, I can show you a rotated version of this sometime. It's really fun. You just take your mouse and you grab it, and you can like rotate the whole thing around, um, which makes it a lot easier to see, but harder to polycom. So I went with a still slide for this. But yeah, it's sort of like these are in one plane, and then these make another sort of, when you, when you rotate it, it sort of looks like this, if, if that helps. <laughs>